Shall we open our Bibles this evening to the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 12? Romans chapter 5, verse 12. <clears throat> Paul began in writing this letter of recommendation for a sister in the Lord to write this wonderful theological book that requires, I think, a lot of uh, concentration and, and willful thought to grasp uh, really the, the essence of the theology of salvation by grace. And it is challenging, it is much easier to study 1 Samuel or 2 Samuel or uh, the book of Acts, which is much of it is narrative. There's doctrine certainly found there, but you get to books like Romans or Colossians or Hebrews, and you really have your work cut out for you. And I hope that you've been working at trying to grab hold of the major truths that Paul sets before us. They're wonderful to know. They'll revolutionize not only the way that you live, but the way you go about reaching out to others and, and knowing where you stand and, and what God has promised. And tonight, I think, is no exception. You know, Paul began in chapter 3, verse 21, after talking to us about the sinfulness of man and the inability that we will have to save ourselves and, and the, the solution that God brought in his son. And he started in chapter 3 to talk about justification. It's a big word that literally means God makes you just as if you'd never sinned. God does that. It's his work. It's immediate the day you get saved. Beginning in chapter, <clears throat> excuse me, chapter 6, Paul then turns to look at sanctification, which is a process of becoming what you are in Christ. You becoming more and more like the person that he's made you. So you, you realize and begin to walk in all that God has done for you. But tonight as we... Uh, finish chapter 5, we are still, for the most part, on this whole issue of justification, how God justifies sinners. And last week in the first part of the chapter, through verse 11 or so, Paul talked about this incredible joy that you and I as Christians can have if we realize the security that we have in Christ. If we are aware of, <clears throat> can grab a hold of, <clears throat> and, and, and really accept the fact that God's work through his Son is complete. Through him you have peace with God. Through him you have acceptance with God. Through him you have access into the grace of God wherein you stand. In, in him and through him you have hope for the future. And nothing can change that. You can feel good one day and feel bad the next and have a good week and a bad week. But, but bottom line, if you're in Christ, you're in. And though there are trials in life and difficulties, and Paul talked about the, 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 the steps that develop you know, our Christian character he ended in verse 9 last time uh, of chapter 5 by uh, saying, much more than having now been justified, just as if I'd never sinned, by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were the enemies of God, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. With certainty of being delivered, with, with abounding, leaping joy, we know that God is more than able to keep us. And Paul's final point before we quit last week was, look, if God's blood can save you when you are in rebellion, how much more do you think the love of God and the power of God can keep you when you're in agreement, when you've surrendered, when you've given up? I'm, Lord, I'm yours. Oh, I wonder if I'm going to stay saved. I'm yours. He saved me when I'm saying, I'm not yours. When Paul was on his way to kill Christians, hey, Paul, you're mine. Wait. <laughs> Fall down in road, dead. Stare up into sky, bright light. Who are you, Lord? <laughs> I'm Jesus. I'm, I'm in. If God can save you when you're in rebellion, how much more? How much more than having been justified can he keep you? Praise the Lord that we've been reconciled. To God. Tonight, as we look at the end of chapter 5, Paul gives to us an extended series of comparisons between Adam and his sin and Jesus, who came to redeem all men from their sin, which they were, you know, passed down to, which they inherited, if you will, which they gained through Adam. It's an important, I think, theological truth that you should grab a hold of. It's vital in your hope in Christ to know <clears throat> what Jesus did. And so 
we get two sections tonight. Verses 12, 13, and 14 talk about the, the obvious truth that death is universal, that the entire human race suffers from it, and then focuses on Adam and the reign of death, his sin engendered in the life of man. The rest of the chapter from verses 15 through 21 focus on Jesus and the life that he brings to all who look to him. Now, it can be a difficult passage. It shouldn't be because it's fairly straightforward. But notice at the end of verse 12 that there's a line. There should be a line in your Bible. It's really a pause. And then verses 13 through 17 are in parentheses because it, it, it indicates Paul was going to say something, decided he better throw in something else. And then in verse 18 goes back to what he was saying in verse 12. It's an aside. It's a, it's a parenthetical statement, if you will. You know, verse um, 18 explains in verse 12 the interruption, and then it picks up again. So let's read verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all have sinned. And then Paul stops. And he says, until the law, sin was in the world, but not imputed when there's no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense, for if by the, uh, if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for... The judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more, he loves the word much more, those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one Jesus Christ. Back to verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man Sin entered the world, and death through sin, and death spread to all men, because all have sinned. Verse 18, therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man, man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Notice in verse 12 the word therefore, because it connects to what Paul had been saying, which you had just read in verse 9, 10, and 11. God has reconciled you and I as Christians in Jesus to himself. And Paul then begins to look at this picture of what we used to be and now what we are. And it'll actually be a, a comparison list for the next three or four chapters. Paul will talk about dead in sin, alive to God, slaves of sin, slaves of God, and that it's better to be a slave of God than a slave to sin. He'll talk about the law and freedom from the law, and yet you have to live with the law, and the law is perfect, but it's not good for you. And he'll make a, a whole series of comparisons, all designed to convince you that in Christ you're fine. You're in good shape. <laughs> you need not worry. You need not fear. You need not struggle. But this, this evening, he begins with these comparisons between Adam and the horrible consequences that brought us into sin, and now the union that you can have with Christ and the glory that he'll make available to you. It's all about parallelism. It's a great way to argue, to, to debate, to, to make a point clear, it was certainly a, a, a Greek and a Hebrew practice as far as writing. Paul is very good at it. And so he picks this issue of, of parallel, uh, setting in, in parallel, if you will. In, in Adam, we're made sinners, we're disobedient, we're headed for judgment, condemnation awaits us. But if we're in Christ, then we're forgiven and we're justified and we're made holy and we're headed for eternal life. Therefore, <laughs> verse 12, through one man, sin entered into the world. Now, sin did not originate with Adam. It originated with Satan and his fall, at least as far as the Bible is concerned. Sin began when Satan rebelled. That was the, the first defiant mark of God's creation against God's will. And in his fall, it is he who came very early in your Bible to tempt Adam and Eve. Now, the order that God gave to Adam that you can find there in Genesis chapter 2 was he put him in the garden of Eden. He told him to tend the garden. He didn't use the word work because before sin, apparently it wasn't so hard. Not, not, not too hard to keep the weeds out when there aren't any weeds, you know. So just tend the garden. No, just tend it. I don't know what that means. It doesn't sound very busy or very hard, you know. 
And the Lord said to the man, to Adam, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. One commandment, don't eat. Adam, tend the garden, enjoy it. You can eat of anything you want, just stay away from that one tree in the midst of the garden. And yet, what did he do? Now, now, there was only one commandment, but there was greatly, and, and, or I should say, there was a severe consequence to disobedience, wasn't there? We know from the Genesis account that Eve was there when Satan came by and began to, to work her over. And she was tempted. She was deceived. She listened to the liar, and she ate. Adam joined her in her sin, though Eve sinned first, the primary responsibility fell on Adam because God had spoken directly to Adam. He had to speak directly to his wife. He had to pass along these things at the head of the household. Now, the one commandment was the only point of submission that God required of Adam. The entire rule of the, or subjugation of the earth, the creation of God, was handed to Adam. He was made, you know, head of those things. You can read there in Genesis chapter 1. But when Adam disobeyed God, when he ate of that one tree that he was told he would surely die, sin entered into life. And the nature of man, God's creation, absolutely changed. He went from innocence to sinfulness. And from that moment on, this innate or instinctive or present from birth sinful nature would now be transmitted through Adam and through his children to every person. So Paul tells us here that, by, that, that sin entered into the world by one man. And it's a singular word. It's not sins. It's sin. It is the nature of sin that would now be passed on to all of our posterity. And God made man to be able to procreate, but as man does, he passes to his children this sinful nature. Not just his physical characteristics, not just his psychological and emotional makeup in his DNA, but his spiritual condition. And the question becomes, how? And the answer is, who knows? God has not fit to describe that to us at all. We do know from the scriptures that this depraved nature of sin was transmitted to Adam's posterity. And because man was a single entity, Adam represented the whole human race. So when Adam sinned, we all sinned. And his first sin transformed his inner nature that we now become party to. Instead of evolving, as humanists would like to tell you, we have devolved as people. Because with every successive generation, we pass along this sinful nature and we nourish that sinful nature so we get better at refusing God. From one generation to the next, we're, we're better at saying no to God. Adam had a hard time. <laughs> His son's a little easier time. Their son's even easier yet. We have this nature that we've, we've developed in it's all of its glory, if that's what you want to call it. But you read in the scripture, Adam was created in the image of God, Genesis chapter 1 Verse 26, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, give him dominion over the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. But then you get to Genesis chapter 5. And you read, and Adam lived 130 years and he begot his son in his own likeness. And his son became more like Adam than he was like God. He still had you know, choice and the ability to make choice. He still had accountability, but he was born with a nature of sin. So immediately he's a sinful man. Not at all made like God in the way that Adam was. And when Adam sinned in the garden, he sinned as a man, but also as man. In fact, his name literally means mankind. And so, you know, Paul makes the assertion there was a literal Adam, and if, if all men didn't fall with Adam, then all men could not be saved by the last Adam. It applies and it affects everyone. So we read, through one man, sin entered into the world. And then the second thing we read is death entered through sin. Death entered the world by sin. As sin entered by one man, so did the consequence. Death followed. 
Now, God created Adam, according to the Bible, to live forever. God's intention was that you and I might just have fellowship with him. That's why he made us. But he was warned that eating of this tree would bring death to his life. And you know what Satan said to Eve? You shall not die. You're going to live. You're going to be wiser and smarter, more intelligent, more insightful. You're going to be like God. But God had said, you eat, you die. And his fate was indeed death, physically and in his relationship to God, spiritually. Sin entered through one man, death entered through sin. Which is a reasonable explanation biblically why sometimes people that are young die. It's not because they have necessarily committed sins, but because they have a sinful nature. Born as sinners. And as descendants of Adam, who is the head of the human race, they inherit the consequence of sin, which is death. A person doesn't become a sinner because he's committing sins. He commits sins because he's a sinner. So the chicken and the egg thing. <laughs> this one's pretty clear. You're sinners first, then you sin. A person isn't a liar because he lies. He lies because there's deceit already in his heart. It's the same thing with adultery. It's the same thing with murder. Jesus said, out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and murders and fornications and theft and false witness and blasphemy. Out of the heart. Because man is by nature sinful. It, it, we inherited that from Adam. Thank you, Adam. It springs from a sinful heart. So sin, sin brings death. Now, now, death, by definition, is separation. And Adam's first death was a separation from God. He was kicked out of the garden. He was no longer having access, really, to the fellowship that he had with God. He was clothed now because all of a sudden he had shame. He was aware of his sin. He had to deal with other sinners in his life, some of them who were not too beneficial to his life. But he was separated from God. Paul said... Uh, to the Ephesians in chapter 2, you has he made alive who were dead in your trespasses and sin. That's the way we're born. That's the way we grow up. Out of fellowship with God. Dead in sin. That was his first death. The second death for Adam was physical. And for us, physical, we, we, we are separated from others by death. Adam did not immediately die physically, but he headed in that direction. All of a sudden, he got older, and he realized he wondered how old he was. So do I. The Bible doesn't say. I don't know if he was made like an 18-year-old. He was 80 when he started. I don't know. Stubborn kid. Must have been young. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> but he became weary, and, and, and he got tired in his work and in his labor, and eventually he died physically. The, the last death, and the Bible calls it the second death, is when you're separated from God for all of eternity. That's where hell is, it waits for you. you know, that's where the judgment of God awaits. And that's what Revelation chapter 21 calls the second death. death the, the, the third kind of death is eternal. You have, you have a spiritual death, you have a physical death, you have an eternal death. Death entered the world by sin. Now, the unbeliever has reason to fear all three. He's born spiritually dead. So try as you will to get in contact with God. If, if God doesn't give you spiritual life, you, you have no life. You can have your religion. You just can't get life. The wages of sin is death. You can't get life. You're born out of fellowship with God. And the minute you're aware of sin and you're aware of what God demands, you realize you're a sinful person. So the, the unbeliever should worry about that, you know. It... it it prevents earthly joy not knowing the Lord. It, pre it prevents finding a real purpose for life. It prevents a lot of things that God would have for you. Physical life, and losing it, that's pretty dangerous. That's the end of the road, you know. You die physically and that's it. Now you have to answer for your life. Any hope of salvation is lost the moment you die. And eternal death is, 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 is permanent. It, it, there's no reversing it. It's irreversible. For the Christian... We don't have to worry about any of that. Spiritually, we've been made alive in Christ, absent from the body, present with the Lord. You get to heaven, you're going to hear, hey, how you doing? All right, something like that. Well done. <laughs> you're going to be ushered into God's presence where you will be welcomed with rejoicing. 
Paul said in Hebrews, Inasmuch then as the children have been partakers of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that's the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Death entered the world by sin. One man, sin entered into the world. And then we read, and death spread to all men, for all have sinned. Another one, in other words, no one escapes dying. It is without exception. There are only two in the Bible that did not physically die, though they were both dead spiritually before turning in trust to God. One of them was Enoch. The other was Elijah. Even Jesus died, though not for his sin, but for ours. But I want you to notice here in verse 12 that the word because all have sinned, sinned is in the aorist tense, which literally means at a point in time. And the reference seems to point to Adam. When Adam sinned, all of mankind was in his loins. Now we can't stop the, the spread or the transmission of sin from one generation to the other. There's no way to stop it. People say, well, when I have kids, they're not going to turn out like your kids. Yeah, but they're going to turn out rotten. <laughs> and their kids aren't going to do so well either, you know. And the reason is there is sin in the world through one man's disobedience. And death followed it. And now all die for all have sinned. Just the way it is. We know only of its legacy because God has told us so in his word. Paul doesn't seek to explain it, how it's passed along. God it doesn't help us. He just declares that it is. But natural human depravity is not the result of some man's sinful actions. In other words, people didn't turn out this way in their nature because someone was extremely wicked. It was passed on to you through birth because of the fall of Adam. You don't have to teach a young ch child to lie. That comes naturally. If you don't teach them anything, they'll lie on their own. They're good at it. My son, at three years old, maybe I told you, I went in the kitchen once. He was standing on the counter, hands in a cookie jar, two shelves up, three chocolate chip cookies and that little chubby fingers of his. And without blinking an eye, I came around the corner and went, Daddy, I got these for you. <laughs> Liar. <laughs> Liar. Absolutely true story. You have to teach kids to tell the truth. Why? Because the natural tendency is to selfishly, come, you know, Cover yourself and lie. It's the same thing with purity. It's the same thing with holiness. Every good thing needs to be taught. And the reason is we sin naturally. Because through the fall of one man, sin had entered the world and death by sin. And all die for all have sinned. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. David was pretty insightful at 1000 B.C. He wrote in Psalm 58, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go, ast they go astray as soon as they're born, speaking lies. And Jeremiah added, the, wicked are, uh, the heart of the wicked is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Eliphaz says to Job in Job 15, what is man that he could be pure? Who is he born of a woman that could be righteous? If God puts no trust in his saints and the heavens are not pure in his sight, how much less man who is abominable and filthy and drinks iniquity like water? Thanks, Eliphaz. <laughs> now, some people complain. They go, now, wait a minute. That's patently unfair. Adam sins, and we get knocked around for it. You know, he falls, and now we're all in trouble. We weren't even there. To which I always reply, all right, you weren't there when Jesus died for your sins either, but he's willing to save you by it. How about that for a fair exchange? Would that be all right to you? He'll give you the benefit of his death if you'll just believe in him. He'll impute it into your account. It's not fair I should die because of Adam's sins. Not fair that Jesus should die for yours. Just the whole thing's not fair. Throw the book out, nothing's fair there. The beginning and the end, not fair. In reality, it is now your own sin of refusing Jesus that will bring judgment. Not Adam's sin. God's provided for that. So now you're left with your sin. <laughs> Come to me and live. Oh, I don't know. All right, now you're on your own. Can I blame Adam? Not anymore. Now verse 13 says, as we begin the parentheses, as Paul stops to think about it, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin isn't imputed when there's no law. Nevertheless, death reigned. From Adam to Moses, 
even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. A lot of words to say history proves that death reigns over all men, right? In other words, everyone dies. From Adam forward, death is found in each person, for sin is passed from one to the next. Now, later on when the law would be given, and it came hundreds of years later, the law would make sin more obvious and make people more accountable for their sin in their relationship with God. But there was enough problems with this sinful nature as Adam had it to cause death that brought death in everyone that followed Adam. So notice the words here from Adam to Moses in verse 14 because that means from the time Adam sinned until the law was given, everyone between there died too. They didn't die according to the law like they broke the Ten Commandments. There were no Ten Commandments. No one could be held uh, accountable specifically for the sins of, of, of rebellion or such that, that you might afterwards be able to be held accountable for because you knew them. Not in the same uh, sin as Adam, not in the same rebelliousness as Adam, but the fact that they got the sinful nature. They weren't dying for disobeying the law. There wasn't any law. They were dying because they had a sinful nature. And because sin came by one man and death by sin, and pretty soon death to all for all of sin, from Adam to Moses, though there was no law, people still dead. You read Genesis 5, the account, and they died, and they died, and they died. It's the most repeated thing in the Genesis 5. And they died. And he lived a couple hundred years, and he had these many children, and he died. And then the next guy, and he died. It just, it's, it's monotony almost, you know. But look, we're in Adam as the human race, and we are judged before the law, because God judged Adam and all of us in him. The doctrine is called federalism. And it's actually a pretty good doctrine. It literally means Adam was man's representative, and he was. Because he fell, we all fell. And it's important to know because Adam was a type of him who was to come. And there's the clue as to where you stand now. Because just like Adam, and the fact that we were all represented in him in failure, in sin, in death, so Jesus now comes to be the federal head of of his kingdom. And if you're in Christ, you gain the same benefits in Christ that you gain the loss of Adam's faithfulness. You know about sickness, you know about dying, you know about selfishness, you know about sinfulness, you know about how the world goes and the destruction that sin brings, and you've experienced it all in your life because you are in Adam. Now if you're in Christ, you can look forward to experience the peace of God and the joy of the Lord and the power of God's spirit and the hope of a future and forgiveness and mercy and kindness and grace. And you should be experiencing that. And both of those were absolutes. You don't come to Christ. You die in Adam. You come to Jesus. You're delivered from the sinfulness of Adam. That's really the, the, the comparison, if you will, that Paul is making. But because in principle of, of human solidarity, if you will, in Adam, all have sinned, but the good news is that all can be delivered, be saved, be freed from the bondage of sin and death, but you're going to have to go to Jesus and his death and resurrection, and he's going to have to become the federal head of your life. Or, if you will, biblically, he's going to have to become your Lord. And in him, everything that you lost in Adam, you gain in Christ, and then more. Because, in fact, the rest of the chapter, he will go much more, much more, much more. Hey, we lost a lot, but we gained much more <laughs> over and beyond. I read of a story of a tombstone on, of four young children who were buried in St. Andrews in Scotland. And on the epitaph, this is what the parents wrote of these four young kids. They were actually killed in a crash. This is what they wrote on the tombstone. Bold infidelity turned pale and died. Beneath this stone four sleeping infants lie. Say, are they lost or saved? If death is by sin, they sinned, for they are here. If heaven is by works, in heaven they cannot appear. Reason? Ah, how depraved. Turn to the Bible's sacred page. The knot is untied. They died for Adam's sin. They live for Jesus died. That was pretty good, man. The parents had to think that through for a while. Look, Christianity and your faith in Christ is the only explanation for the universal reign of death and the only solution for man's problem, which is a representative, Jesus Christ, who they find themselves in. And as they have had by their birth a union with Adam, they can, through their rebirth, have union with Christ. That's why you make it. That's where your security. And when we read in verse 14, 
he is a type of him who is to come. Now you might say, how? Well, look, both were appointed by God as representatives for other men, as heads of particular bodies of people or races or descendants, if you will. Both had covenants made with them by God. Both passed on the effect of their disobedience or obedience to others. The first Adam, the last Adam. And the comparisons run on and on through the Bible. And the reason is so that you might see as buried in the hole as you were once over here, you are totally free over here in Christ. And union with Christ is far greater and more glorious in effect than your union with Adam, which you couldn't choose, could ever be. Verse 15, the free gift is not like the offense. If by one man's offense many died, much more, and you should circle that word, the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, will abound to many. The union with Christ, here's the first contrast, the one of effectiveness. And it is clearly between the free gift of Jesus and the transgression of Adam. Now, by definition, all gifts are free. But the gift word here is the, is the Greek word charisma, which means a special favor or a graciousness or a gracious gift. When charisma is used to speak about something you give to God, it is always used only of that which God would find acceptable to him. When it is used to speak about his gift to you, to man, it always refers to something that is completely given apart from human merit. It isn't an earned, it isn't a reward, it isn't a payment, it isn't a wage. It's a gift of grace. And that's the comparison that we read here in verse 15. The free gift compared to the sin or to the offense of Adam. One man's offense and then the grace of God and the gift by that grace in Christ. Those are the comparisons. Now, the offense is, 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 the, is the normal Greek word for someone who deviates from the path. It means to depart from the norm or go where you shouldn't go. It is most often translated in the Bible, trespass, like you were trespassing. You don't belong here. This isn't your place. This isn't where you should be. You've gotten off the road, you know. You're trespassing. That's what the word is. Adam's one sin, trespass, going where he shouldn't have gone, brought death to all. In fact... Notice we read the word many here, and I just want to point it out to you because when you use parallelism, which is the, you know, the, the, the speech tool, if you will, the debate tool that Paul is using, you, know, you might say, well, no, no, not many died, all died. In fact, we just read that back in verse 12. Now he says many. Before he says all, could he please make up his mind? He's comparing the many that fell to the many that can come to the Lord because not all will come to the Lord, even though all could. And so whenever parallelism is used, be careful that you don't, you know, you're not pressing. You know better. All die because of sin. Yet, you know, here uh, Paul focuses on the comparisons, the parallel, if you will. Uh, many versus all. We'll see it again in verse 18 and 19. By eating the forbidden fruit, Adam departed from God's standard. He entered a divinely forbidden area, right? Disobedience. But instead of becoming more like God, as Satan, by the way, had promised Eve, if you eat, you'll be like God, Genesis 3, 5, he became more unlike his creator. He became more, he, you know, he could describe him as more ungodlike. He was separated from him. Instead of drawing closer to God in his sin, he was driven away from God, and he found himself in Satan's realm, misery and darkness and suffering and blindness and fear and ultimately death awaited him. That was the offense of one. Now Paul's point here is that Jesus' one act of salvation had an immeasurably greater impact than Adam's one act of damnation. And he constantly uses the words much more. Because though the sin of Adam brought death, which is the natural consequence of sin, the grace of God in Christ brought far greater things. It brought innocence to the guilty, but it also gave us a new nature. It forgave our sin, and then it gave us a new heart. It washed away our trespass and our wandering, or our trespassing, if you will, and then it gave us a life within, a, a, an outlook, a character, a soul that was God-like. 
We, we became partakers of his divine nature as we turned to Jesus. God's grace is even greater than man's sin. Adam's sin brought death for everyone, but the effect of Jesus' redemptive act not only restores man to a spiritual life, but he gives him God's life. <laughs> he doesn't just restore him to the time when he didn't sin. He gives him the life of God to dwell within him. Death is by nature pretty static. You know, it's empty, it's natural, yet life abounds in Christ. You get saved, there's this supernatural work of God living in you. So here at the end of the verse, the word many is used in a more typical sense. For only those receiving Jesus by faith can have this life. Remember verse, five, uh, verse 1 of chapter 5 or verse 11? Not only that, but we also rejoice that through our Lord Jesus Christ, through him, we have received reconciliation. The only way you're going to get right with God is to come through Jesus, who breaks the power of sin and death. But the converse isn't true. <laughs> you know, you, in Adam, Adam's sin is, is reversible. You know, you can be saved now, much more now. You know, you fall in sin like all of us, like man born in sin. There's a way out now. But once you're in Christ, it doesn't go back the other way. It's, it's irreversible. Much more now you have life in Christ. Over here, you're dead, but there's a way out, Christ. But over here, you're in Christ. There's no way out. You're in. You're good. Much more now, you shall be saved through his life. The condemnation of Adam is reversible through the cross. The redemptive act of Jesus who purchased us at Calvary is not. When he saves me, I'm saved for good. It is eternally effective. And that's really what verse 15 is all about, the, the contrast of effectiveness. What did Adam's sin bring as far as destruction? What did the gain that we find in Christ in terms of effectiveness? In verse 16, the contrast is one of extent. Notice it says, And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from the one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from any offenses resulted in justification. Now, the focus of verse 15 is sin, but the focus on verse 16 is the sinner. Adam committed one sin, right? There was only one law. And that one sin brought condemnation to the entire world. Jesus dies once on the cross, but not just for one sin, but for every sin. Not just rebellion, but everything that that rebellion then produced. And through his death, he provides the forgiveness of all sins. And there's where the word justification comes in again. We are made, everyone who comes to Christ, just as if we'd never sinned. I am now not taken, now I, I don't get just brought back to the sin of Adam and my sinful nature. I get brought over here given a new nature. The extent of his salvation is, is God can reach sinners in every place. He loves the sinner so much he provides redemption, not just for one man in his sin, but for all men and all of their sin. God is in Christ Reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, has committed to the believers the word of reconciliation. God is in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Adam sinned once, and all mankind dies in their sins. Jesus dies once. He redeems every man from every sin that he has ever committed or will ever think about committing. Two practical truths. One, God hates sin so much, it takes but one sin to condemn the entire human race, separate them from himself. The other hand, he loves us so much, he will let his son die for every man's sin, though only many will come. The, the, the extent of his redemption, the effectiveness, verse 15, the extent, verse 16, and then in verse 17, the greatness of, the rec, of, the, of our rescue is, is the contrast between death and life. Notice he says, if by one man's offense, Adam's death can reign through that one, much more. Those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Neither Adam or Eve sinned because they wanted to die. Am I right? They sinned because they expected to improve their life. No one sins because they think it'll bring the consequence. They sin because they feel like, I'm bettering myself. You know, I'll lie a little, I'll get ahead. I'll steal a little, I'll get a little richer. I'll, I'll promote myself and I'll get further ahead. I'll, sin offers hope to the deceived. You shall not die. You'll be like God. Don't be afraid. God's holding out. Yeah, he is. He's tough. I need stuff. They wanted to be more like God, but what did their sin produce? 
Just the opposite. Just the opposite of what a Satan promised. Just the opposite of what sin promises. The divine intent of Jesus on the cross in his death was to redeem man. To deliver him from the power of sin and death. And he did just that. But he did more than restore us to where Adam stood before the fall. Much more, <laughs> we're going to reign in life now through Christ. It, it speaks about a life that is here. Not just in the life to come. But now, today, he moves in. We have victory. We have power over sin. We are, as, as Paul writes, more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are more than conquerors. How awesome is that? Victors, not victims in Christ. Adam turned to sin for life and found death. He had a righteousness given to him through creation. But he lost it in sin. We turn to Jesus and he dies. And he offers us who look to him an abundance of grace, a gift of righteousness, a life where he can reign, and a righteousness that secures us. We get far more. <laughs> Then Adam lost. Hey, it's not fair Adam died. Yeah, but you should see the unfair part when it comes to what you get now. You think that was bad. Wait till this is worse. <laughs> Adam ripped us off, but we're ripping God off. And he seems to like it. Come and believe and trust. It's my joy to give you the kingdom. It, it, it pleases me to, to bruise my son, we read in Isaiah 53. God looked forward to you as being you know, his inheritance amongst the saints. Well, then we get to verse 18, and, and the, the last few verses talk about this justification, just as if I never sinned, by grace. So we read in verse 18, Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, and the judgment was condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, a free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of his life. For as by one man's disobedience Many were made sinners. We know it's all from verse 12, but it's parallelism. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. And that's what he's paralleling with. The contrast is verse 18 and 19, obedience versus disobedience. Adam versus Christ. One trespass, one righteous act. Disobedience, disobedience. Death, life. Condemnation, justification. And, and sanctification starts in chapter 6. God will then begin to change us. But notice one offense brought condemnation, while Jesus' righteousness will justify any life who looks to him. And I would point out to you that in verse 18, it is the free gift, man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men. If anyone says to you, well, I don't know if God's chosen you to be saved, let me read this to you again. God's righteous gift comes to all men. Jesus didn't die for part of you, for some of you. He died for all of you, or for none of you. In Adam, you're, you're doomed. In Christ, you're saved. And God so loves the world, <laughs> he gave Jesus so that you could be delivered much more than. One man's disobedience and many, yet many by Jesus' obedience will be made righteous. Many and not all because you have to come to him by faith. His sacrifice was sufficient for all. It is available to all. It is capable for all. But you got to come. Jesus said to the nation for a time, I have life. Why won't you come to me so I might give you life? Verse 20 says, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigns in death, even so grace reigns through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now he had mentioned back in verse 13 that until the law, sin was in the world, but it was not imputed when there was no law. That, that the law came well after man was already dying due to his sinfulness passed down through Adam. Yet to these who had the law, Paul now adds this glorious promise. The law of God, and basically in, in the Old Testament, the law of God had three parts. There was a moral law, the Ten Commandments. 
there was a ceremonial law that allowed the children of Israel and strangers to have some kind of access to God, who was holy, though they were sinful. And then there was the, um, what would we call it, the uh, spiritual law. The laws of, 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 of obedience and relationship with God. None of them were ever designed by God to be a means of salvation. They were a pattern of righteousness. They were never given as a means for it. The law only had power to condemn. And by the time we get to verse, oh, I don't know, verse 13 or 14 of chapter 6, and, and especially those last 9 or 10 verses, really good, talk about it a lot, um, we will learn that the law only has power to condemn until you come to Jesus, and then he gives you the power to obey. It's a very interesting relationship we have with the law. It can only condemn you until you get saved. And then you look at it when you're saved, and you go, wow, that's right on. Lord, make me like this. And by his power, you become the very things that used to condemn you. It used to hurt me. Now it blesses me. It used to be a chastising influence. Now it's an encouragement that God is at work in my life. The law identifies sin to make it easier for us to see ourselves as sinful. Uh, we, we'll talk about it more at the end of chapter 6, but, you, you know, it's kind of like the sign that you say, you read, and it says, don't pick the flowers. And what do you do? <laughs> yeah, I just like to pick one flower, because they say, don't pick the flower. Well, look at me now, you know. Because sin is rebellion. And so when God gives you the law and says, don't do this, his intention is to convict you of the fact that you'll do it. But sin is emboldened by rules because it's rebellion. And so I will be even more sinful. So you'll read that the righteous, uh, holy law of God actually produced more sinfulness in those who won't be chastised by it. You know, the sign is good. Don't pick the flowers in and of itself. But it'll never enable you not to pick the flowers. It causes a restriction in your life. And sin sees that as resentment or stay off the grass. Or no U-turn here. <laughs> or hands-free. What is it with the hands-free thing? Check this out. This is apparently illegal. But this is okay. Where does that change in between here and there? Just something I had in my mind. I don't know what to do with So Paul writes here at the end of chapter 5, sin, verse 21, reigns in death. That's where sin does its greatest work, death. That's what it leads to. That's what it brings with it. That's what its reward is, if you will. But grace will reign through right standing with God to eternal life, and that is found through Jesus Christ. Grace did much more. Get used to the phrase. Look, no, in other words, no one is beyond God's grasp. Sin will kill everyone. Grace can reach anyone. Yeah, but I've done a lot of wrong things. Well, you're going to die. Yeah, but I've done worse things than dying. Okay, God can still save you. Because the grace of God is still available. All of grace, for nothing compelled God to act this way towards you. Nothing in us compelled him. It's the grace of God. So, the ruin from Adam, and you see that all around you, has been more than addressed by the cross of Jesus where eternal life is found. And the offer is to every man, because every man has sinned, every man needs a savior, every man needs the grace of God. But in Christ, you're in a, you're in a different federalist program, you know? Uh, I was born a human being through Adam with a sinful nature. I am born again in Jesus Christ. And now I have peace and rest and joy and hope and eternal life and a God who, who says, try to snatch him out of my hand. And promises he'll finish what he started. He'll never leave me or forsake me. One day he'll present me faultless before his throne. Who rejoices over me as his own inheritance. That's where I stand now. It can't be on both sides. Early on, years earlier, compared to what? <laughs> well, from Romans, certainly. Years earlier, Saul, I'm sorry, I got stuck in the middle of something was rejected by God for being king over Israel. And David, as a very young man, was anointed king. And yet David would have to wait years to come into his kingdom. Those who continued to support Saul would be eventually very disappointed. It would be seven and a half years of um, David running until Saul died. 
It would be nearly seven and a half more years of ruling over a real small populated Judah while everyone else and Benjamin, while everyone else turned away and said, you know, we don't want David. We want one of Saul's kids. We've always been Saul kind of people. This family votes Saul. Well, they were disappointed and they were defeated in shame. And those who shared with David in the, in the calling of God found a kingdom of joy and peace that in David's time was unparalleled in Israel. They, they had the best of life. And it's kind of the same way for us. Jesus is the Lord of all, and yet he hasn't returned yet to establish his kingdom upon the earth. For now, he is ruling by choice in individual hearts, his body, his people, those who have looked to him, whose hearts have been turned to him through his son. Satan continues to offer lies to the children of Adam. He's still running, you know, roughshod over the old creation. Still saying, be your own God, be your own man, have your own way, don't bend your knee, you're going to be just fine, you know, have it your way. And, and meanwhile, the church cries out, grace and righteousness will be found in Jesus. And one day the Lord steps in and he rules, and then you're either very ashamed or greatly rejoicing. You only be in one of two camps. This one you didn't pick. You're in Adam. Sorry about that. Oh, I didn't want to be in Adam. Tough. Well, could I get out? Yes. How? Go to Jesus. It's the Adam camp or the Jesus camp. It's all you got. But how awesome that you are justified by grace. You can stand before God clean as if you never sinned once and for all. Next week, we will begin chapter 6. We'll go through, uh, I think, through verse 13, I'm pretty sure. So read ahead. Father, thank you tonight for our position in Christ and our union with him. And that just... Because we are in Christ, we have this glorious hope that, that can't be taken away, that it doesn't diminish, that, that isn't less than maybe what we could have had. Everything we lost in Adam's sin, our, our freedom, our, our hope, our, our, our ability to just live good lives, honest lives, selfless lives. Everything we lost, our, our, our freedom, our, our health, our you know, freedom from sickness, freedom from worry, freedom from care. Everything we forfeited when Adam fell. Father, now in Jesus, we get back. We get peace and rest. We get hope and joy. We get an assurance of our salvation and the indwelling of your Holy Spirit and your word on it that you won't leave us. Your word that you won't forsake us. Your word that, that you're going to finish what you start. Your word that you will provide, you will forgive, you will restore, you will use us, you will help us, you will fill us, you will bless us. And one day you will gather us to yourself and even one day you will come and rule and reign over us. Lord, how we thank you that though we are born in iniquity, we are saved by grace. And it is that grace in Christ by which, as Paul writes there in Romans 5, we stand. Look, tonight, if you're not in Christ, then you're in Adam still, because that's where we all start. That's pretty much a common bull in Christ. That's a place of choice and calling and obedience and faithfulness. And if the Lord brought you here to church tonight so that you might know that, praise God that tonight you can change sides. You can willfully hear the voice of God and you can enter into his kingdom. Jesus said in John that he was the door into the sheepfold. You try to get in another way, it's like being a thief or a robber or a murderer. Another way, there, there's transgressing ways, you know, there's, there's unacceptable ways to try to get into heaven. But the door is Jesus. Only one door works, Jesus. The second Adam, the last Adam, the one who now represents all mankind and takes all of their sin and by him bring salvation and life to those who will look to him and if tonight you don't know Jesus would you come and pray with one of the pastors after the service and, and let them lead you in a prayer to give Christ your life let them give you some Bible studies to take home so that you might know the scriptures God's promises to you so that you would be saved if you're not sure of your salvation come and pray because you should be sure God doesn't want you in the I hope so mode in, in, in the, oh, I hope it's true. I, I, I hope I qualify. I hope I'm in. You're either in Christ or you're not. And God's promises are sure and they're amen and they're without apology. 
He'll save you tonight. He'll assure you this evening. If you've ever doubted for a moment where you stood, you come and pray. And may God's word through Paul to the Romans convince you there is nothing that can be done to shake you out of the hand of God. Because it is for